pray and we ask the Lord, uh, you know, what to do about everything. And uh, so my wife and I, we prayed and the Lord spoke to me. I first prayed and then and to ask the Lord to show us what to do. And then my wife prayed. And while my wife was still praying, the Lord said to me, Jeremiah 14, 8. So I was like, okay. So I flip over there in my Bible and it literally says, uh, I'll just read it to you guys. It's crazy. But it literally says like, should God be in a hotel room like a traveler? And I was like, okay, whatever the boss says. It's so crazy. I'm, I'm sure it's just a, by coincidence. Yeah. I secretly have my Bible memorized. It says, oh, the hope of Israel, his savior in time of trouble. Why should you, notice the U is capitalized, talking about God. Why should you be like a stranger in the land and like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night? I was just like, all right, Lord, I'm sorry. Uh, we will leave the hotel. We are gone. Sorry. How awesome is the Lord though, right? We, when, you, when, you ask, uh, when you ask him, he wants to speak. We always say that God wants you to do, know his will more than you want to know his will. Because we hear his will and we're like, <laughs> any second opinions? Any other? God's like, no, that's it. It's what you got. But no, God wants to speak to us, right? He wants to guide us and direct us. And he says, your word is a light into my path and a guide into my, guide into my feet and a light into my path, right? He speaks to us through his word, through his spirit. Beautiful. All right, so Philippians session three. This morning we are going to be covering a whole lot of verses. And by a whole lot, I do mean five. Uh, so that's quite a bit more than we've been doing. So it's a heavy passage. You'll see. It's, I mean, it's Paul. Paul's writings are pretty doctrinally rich. So, uh, rarely do you get off easy with Paul and be able to do like a whole chapter on a Sunday morning or something like that, unless we do it like, uh, we're missionaries and just preach all day long. And then you guys can freak out and cry about that. But so we'll start by reading over this morning's text, but we're going to start reading from verse three, just to get the fuller context of the passage, because the passage does begin in verse three. And then we'll just stop in verse 11 and start to take it apart from verses 7 through 11. So Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 3, Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all, for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you, for you all, with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So Paul is, uh, we've discussed this before, you know, before uh, modern times, and by modern I mean, you know, since the sexual revolution of the 1960s, before that, it was universally uh, acknowledged and accepted that Paul was, you know, probably the greatest intellect of the last 2000 years. Nobody doubted that. And when you read his writings, you're just like, dude, sometimes you'll hear someone, especially on the internet and they'll talk and they'll say so much, so many words, but they'll say so little. And you're just like, that was nothing. That was a lot of fluff. I don't even know what they were trying to say with Paul. It's the exact opposite. Paul speaks like libraries in a few sentences and you're just like, oh my goodness, how, I don't, I mean, you can devotionally read through, you know, the writings of Paul, you can read through them like you would any letter because they are epistles, they are letters. But if you're going to try to take them apart, you better have some time, you better have some paper and some resources, some notes, right? Just sit down and be like, whoa, because with Paul, you're drinking from the fire hose, Right. So we'll paraphrase what he's basically saying in verses seven through nine, or even a little bit before you guys, but he's basically like, he's like, 
I believe this about you guys, you know, that, that God will continue the work that he's begun. He's like, I believe this about you guys because I love you guys. And you guys have been with me through thick and through thin, and you guys are on fire for Jesus. And my prayer for you guys is that you guys will grow in God's love more and more, and that that love will be founded, will be anchored in both knowledge and discernment. That's essentially what Paul's saying here. Few words are as uh, abused and misused and exaggerated and thrown about in our culture today as the word love. You know, we use the word love way differently and way too often and very flippantly, really. You know, I think that we all understand this. We, you know, I love tacos. I love that shirt, right? I love uh, my family. I love Jesus. You know, obviously not in that order though, right? And very obviously not to the same degree. But therein lies a small part of the problem. You know, we use that same word. In Greek, they had three different, technically you could even try to count four, but three different words for love that all, you know, there's the brotherly love, uh, uh, phileo, then there was the the erotic love, eros, and then there was the, the love like a, a father for his child or like the love that God has for us, the agape love, and you could even throw charis in there, but that's a whole... We'll go into on a and then another on another day, but that's a small part of the problem, right? These the way we use this one word to mean all these different things, but that's only a small part of the problem. And I think the the issue of far greater concern to us is the world's recent hijacking of the word love, wherein now loving someone necessarily also means approving and I dare say even celebrating their sin. Like, oh, it's a package deal. If you love me, you know, you love all of me and you love me just the way that I am. Whereas we always joke with God's love. Well, God loves you just the way that you are. Not a period, comma. But he loves you too much to leave you that way. You know, if my kids, we always use this analogy, if my kids are filthy because they've been playing around in the mud, I still love them. I'm still going to let them come into my house, but they're getting ho- hit with the pressure washer or the fire hose first, right? And it's the same with God. It's no different. He loves you just the way that you are, but if you're in him and you're justified, then you will be sanctified. That fire hose will hit you and it will wash you. It will clean you. If you really loved me, you'd be happy that I find my, my pleasure and my gratification in something that's destructive to me and others. What? That's insanity. Literally insanity. You know, a lot of the behaviors that we associate with this kind of mentality were back, you know, 40, 50 years ago by the American Psychological Association, which is a bunch of crackheads who believe that in Freud's writings, don't even get me started, literally cokeheads. But they would classify those beliefs and uh, affections as psychological disorders. For all of history, it's been that way. But now it's celebrated. Now it's brave. It's beautiful and everything like that. And so there's this push now that if you really if you really love me, you know, you'll accept and approve and celebrate everything that I am about, even if it means that it'll destroy me and others, and even if it means it'll eternally separate me from God. Wow. Guys, if your friend's about to get hit by a car, how hard would you shove them to push them out of the way? Whatever, whatever needs to be done, right? You're like, dude, I am, I am doing this. I'm getting them out of the way. My wife, one time when she was young and foolish, she was out uh, for a night on the town with her friends. This is way before she was a Christian, probably uh, four, four years before she got saved, something like that. And she was out partying with her friends. And my wife uh, was probably three sheets to the wind, but she was kind of like stumbling out in the street, not like stumbling as bad as it sounds, but like kind of just like walking out in the street and her friend saw a car coming and her friend yanked her back and pulled her out of the way of that car and she didn't get hit by the car. Do you think my wife was upset? Like, how dare you? You stretched my shirt. (laughs) That's exactly how our culture is now, right? And not only that, but I wanted to go in front of that car. If you really loved me, what? Think of the insanity. Church, that's not love. That's affirmation and to a large degree enabling. 
if we love someone, do we have to affirm and enable everything that they are doing that's destructive? If you really love someone, won't you tell them that's destructive? Won't you tell them, hey, that not only will destroy you, but it'll eventually separate you from God for eternity? And affirmation, let's be real here, affirmation is not necessarily always a bad thing. It can be a great thing, but it can be a bad thing. We shouldn't act like it's always a great thing. It can be a bad thing, particularly when we're affirming and confirming someone in their rebellion against God. So Paul, speaking in the Holy Spirit, speaking through the Spirit, says to the church in Philippi and to us that he wants our love to be founded upon knowledge and discernment. In the same way that believers, that the believer's disposition must be tempered by grace and peace. Remember we covered that two weeks ago? In the same way believers love, the believer's love must be grounded by knowledge and discernment. Our disposition must be founded and grounded in grace and peace. And our love must be grounded in knowledge and discernment. A love that's devoid of both knowledge and discernment embraces and upholds things that are not only contrary to God's commands, but also destructive to those who embrace them. Nothing can be more offensive and meaningless to both God and reason than to say love is love. What about like with animals? Or is it is love still? Like, think how insane this is. I think of the insanity. Love is love. Uh, no, no. What? Think, think how crazy that is, though. Think how disconnected from reality that is. Let's try this on. And that might offend people, right? That's going to for sure offend our culture saying that. But let's try this on, okay? Let's try this on. Imagine you go to the hospital, okay? You're in the ICU. They're, they're wheeling you into the operating room, and you ask the doc, and you say, hey, um, what, what, blood is that blood type? what blood type is that blood I'm about to receive? And the doc looks at you, and he rolls his eyes, and he says to you, hey, pal, look, blood is blood. <laughs> I'm going to die right now. <laughs> You're giving me the wrong blood type. I am in a lot of trouble. And, you know, there are different types of blood, and one's not better than the other, but that's not true of the blood type that you were made to take. It's absolutely better. The blood that you were made to take, the love that you were made to take, is the kind that God designed you to take. So if you take that wrong blood type, it'll kill you. Straight up, you'll die. And if you take that wrong love spiritually you will die you'll be separated from god and as humans we're created in god's image and the kind of love that we were created to take is a love founded upon knowledge it's a discerning love people are like oh yeah i i don't discriminate sure you do every time you put food in your mouth you discriminate if you don't you're not going to last very long That's why you don't stop on the side of the road every time you see protein that got hit by a car. Oh, there's protein. Hey, (laughs) protein's protein. Uh, That's been dead for three months, bro. (laughs) But there's a lot of collagen. I see some skin. (laughs) You're not going to last very long. We laugh, but it's insanity, right? It's the same kind of thing. We need to have a love that isn't ignorant of spiritual realities. You know, people point to their desires and their urges as being natural as though that's a vindication of man's inherent depravity. Oh, it's natural. (laughs) Uh, Well, you know, I was born this way. Okay. This is true. That's why the Bible says you need to be born again. That's the whole point. You're like, now you're understanding the problem. Yes. Very good. Very good. If we're going to point to nature and animal behaviors as the justification of our behaviors, then there's no sense against having laws against rape or murder or incest or robbery or uh, pretty much any behavior that we deem to be criminal because animals do all of those things, don't they? 
yeah. So when someone says, I was born this way, you're like, yeah, that's the whole point, dude. That's why we need to be born again. That's why Jesus says, unless a man's born again, he will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is like Bible 101, but our culture is so divorced from the teachings of God's word that they have no idea. We all have propensities and tendencies to sin. You know, I've made the point before that, you know, my uncle killed a man who was trying to rob him. You know, my family's got a long line of criminals and drug dealers and everything else. Does that mean I should be allowed to sell drugs or be violent or anything like that? You punch someone in the face. Well, officer, you know, (laughs) I'm Irish. (laughs) You get pulled over for a DUI. Sorry, I'm Scottish, man. We just... You know how it is. Officer's like, yeah, for sure. No, you're good to go. Like, what? Think how insane that is. We would never try that. Would that work in court? Oh, you know, it's just just my nature. Uh, My dad was violent too. My dad was a drunk too. Yeah, that's the whole point. We all have these tendencies, these propensities to sin. That's precisely why we need a savior. That's why Jesus doesn't fix our heart. He gives us a new heart because we're screwed up. All of us, we're all screwed up. And one person's sin isn't better than another. So please don't think this message is about homosexuality or something. No, no, no. You might not be tempted by homosexuality, but I guarantee you, you have a propensity to like something that's destructive to you that will eternally separate you from God. We always make the point that the sin that we should be most concerned about is our own. And that's where this is at, guys. That's the whole point of this message. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we need to be born again. Because our desires are messed up. 70% of American men watch pornography. More people smoke weed nowadays than smoke cigarettes. Marijuana turns off the frontal cortex of your brain. That's the part of your brain that you use to commune with God. (laughs) And that's not even getting into how many people are getting plastered or popping pills. One third, there's 30,000 college kids in our area, 30,000. One third of college students are on Adderall. Uh, That's meth. Yeah, that's literally four different amphetamine salts. That's meth. Go on Wikipedia and look. It's four different amphetamine salts. It's like super meth, actually. (laughs) <laughs> 10,000 kids in this area are on it. 10,000 kids in this area are on meth. We love things that are bad for us. Whether or not they're socially acceptable, that doesn't even matter. Do you think God cares what's socially acceptable? What's socially acceptable is static, in case you haven't noticed. One culture looks at one thing as taboo or wrong. Another culture embraces it or even celebrates it, right? So we're changing. Our culture is changing. So we can't point to that and be like, well, you know, the culture that I was involved in was fine with that. Yeah, they're fine with murdering babies of inconvenience too. You think God's cool with that? It was an issue in Paul's day, and it's an issue in our day. It's part of the natural condition of man. That's why the Bible talks about the carnal man, the natural man. Because that's where we all are before Christ. We're all screwed up. We all like things that are destroying us, that are hurting us, that are hurting others, that are separating us from God. That's why Paul's desire for the Philippians and for us here this morning is that we grow in love And that that love is a love that won't destroy us and result in our eternal separation from God. A love that instead is founded upon knowledge and discernment. And we'll talk about this more because Paul then fleshes it out in verses 10 and 11. Take a look at verses 10 and 11. He continues. He says, that you may approve the things that are excellent that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So Paul here basically just makes the same point that we went over and kind of fleshes it out. He makes the point that our love isn't just a blind love, it's a discerning love. It's not just indiscriminate. Lest we find ourselves loving evil 
as we see going on all around us, right, in our culture today. But instead, Paul's saying we got to have a love that approves, this is literally his quote, look what he says right here, that approves the things that are excellent. The Greek word there for excellent is the word that most often translates as most valuable or more valuable. And then it gets worse. He goes on and says, that you may be sincere or literally pure, without offense. The word there is blameless. So, church, what's the opposite of pure? Absolutely, unpure, defiled. That's literally what I wrote, unpure, defiled. In church, what's the opposite of blameless? Guilty. So what happens, church, if we embrace this kind of love that our culture says we need to embrace? Before God, we're defiled and guilty. Yeah, that's right. That's right, Bella. So yeah, bad news, man. Think how crazy that is, guys. Paul's heavy, huh? Paul's stuff is deep because you don't see that when you just quickly read through it. But if you read, if you knew the Greek, like these guys who were reading this letter, they were like, "Oh my goodness." He's like, "Yeah, your love needs to have knowledge and discernment behind it. Otherwise, you're defiled and guilty before God." Whoa! And all around town. There's churches preaching that love is love. Churches, pastors, and they're full, but they're empty. And the day after the rapture, those churches will be full. And we'll be explaining to all the Calvinists on the way up that (laughs) it's okay. So what's the danger, church, if our love, our affection isn't founded in knowledge and discernment? Well, that will be unpure and defiled and guilty before God. That's a pretty heavy price, huh? So this is a serious issue that's worthy that's worthy of us fleshing this out. Can't we all just love whatever, whoever we want? Well, you can, right? God's given us free will. We're free to reject him uh, and be eternally separated from him, and tragically billions do, right? But if we do reject him and love whatever or whoever we want, divorced from God's guidance and direction, we will be defiled and guilty before him. When we stand before him and mark my words, church, every single human on this earth will absolutely 100% stand before him. And they won't be able to claim ignorance because he's reaching out to everybody and he's using us to do it, right? As we go around talking to people. We've talked about it before, the story of Patty Height. Patty was a lesbian. And Patty was there in a hotel room. She had just finished fornicating with her lover. And they were both just laying there on the bed, looking up at the ceiling. And I don't remember if it was Patty or her then girlfriend who said, do you ever feel like what we're doing is wrong? She said, I was just thinking the exact same thing. So they reached over into the drawer, pulled out the Gideon's Bible and randomly flipped it open and put their finger down on the verse that says it is an abomination for a woman to lie with a woman like a woman lies with a man. And they both walked away from their sinful lifestyle, became born again Christians, got married, have husbands, and now lead ministries telling people who are in that lifestyle that there is hope and that there is love, that Jesus loves them and wants to save them. Not that they're going to burn in hell like the Westboro Baptist FBI, I mean, uh, church. No, not like that. God's desire is that we walk with him. God's desire is that we walk in truth. Rather than being deceived by Satan, who for the moment is in control of this world until Christ's return. And church, very important, look at the end of verse 10. Verse 10 says, that you may approve the things that are excellent and that you may be sincere and without offense, period? No, till the day of Christ. Okay, I'm lost. What just happened? Why would the Holy Spirit inspire Paul 
to put those words at the end of verse 10. Remember, church, we believe in the verbal inspir- the verbal plenary inspiration of the scriptures, meaning that we believe that every word, every place name, it's all there by design. God, God is the author of language and he knows how to use it. So why did God, out of the blue, seemingly for no reason, put the words till the day of Christ at the end of that verse, talking about how our love, if we don't want to offend God and be defiled and guilty before him, needs to be founded upon knowledge and discernment. Why did God put that in there until the day of Christ? Well, there's a very good reason. Because God knows the future. And God knew that at the end of time, there would be a whole lot of air quote Christians and pastors who are saying, love is love. And God wants to make it very clear that this admonition from Paul through the Holy Spirit to the Philippians and therefore to us here this morning isn't some cultural thing, but it's till the very end of time when the whole world will say, hey, just love whoever you want. Love is love. Free love. Who cares? God knew that at the end of time, right before the day of Christ, that there would be loud voices of these professing themselves to be Christian who would try to claim that love, even so-called Christian love, need not be founded upon knowledge and discernment. That love is love. And that Christians should be loving without knowledge and without discernment. We love everyone. Everyone's welcome here. Well, everyone's welcome here too. But don't think we're going to pat you on the back for your sin all the way into hell. How would that be loving? That's the most unloving thing you could do. (laughs) The culture might congratulate you for it. But you better believe that person's not going to think you're super cool when they're getting ushered into hell by a fallen angel. They're not going to be like, oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Amen. That love that Paul here is imploring us to have, this wise and discerning love, well, it's outdated, right? Times have changed. You know, the world, the church even, needs to embrace a new love. God knew that they would be saying that. And so he told Paul through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's the author of all scripture, to put in there till the day of Christ, all the way until the end. And God knew that this push, this attack from Satan would come. So he reminds us here in verse 10 that no, this isn't just instruction for the time of Paul. These guidelines pertaining to how we love will remain all the way until the second coming of Jesus Christ. In order that we may be sincere and without offense, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So church, let's be known for our love. Let's love people that God has placed in our lives, not by affirming their sin and their rebellion against God, but by loving them enough to share Christ with them and tell them, hey, look, God loves you just the way that you are. But he loves you too much to leave you that way. Because we love him, because he first loved us, we're no better. We're just cleaned up. We're just saved. And he wants to use us as ambassadors, pleading with men to be reconciled to God, that same message. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And Lord, we pray that we would put this into practice in our own lives, Lord, that we would be loving, but loving enough, Lord, to tell the people the truth, that you love them, that you want to save them, but that it's good news because there is bad news. And that bad news is that our sin separates us from you. So Lord, give us wisdom. Lord, give us discernment in our love. But Lord, help us to be bold and to share your love with all those people that you bring into our lives. Use us to build your kingdom here in these last moments. And Lord, help us to be faithful and to trust in you and to represent you well. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you and we worship you. And we pray that you'd bless the time of fellowship that we're going to have now. In Jesus' name, amen. Did we
just alive.